The purpose of this show, the of this show is to guide you to realign, to realign with habits that get you to live the life, live the life you've always dreamed of. Right. This, this is the Habit-Based Lifestyle Podcast with Jesse Ewing. This is the habit-based lifestyle Where you can access your full potential right now Finally break free from destructive habits That dream life, if you want it, you can have it This is where you transform your health Mind, business, and relationships Or do nothing and keep your life the way it is But if you're ready for change, you're in the right place This is where you're gonna learn how to live a habit-based lifestyle You, you, you are tuning in to the Habit-Based Lifestyle Podcast With, with, with your host, Jesse Yule This is this is the habit-based lifestyle. Let's go. Welcome back to the habit-based lifestyle podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Yule. And today we're going to be talking about uh, the habit of understanding each other. Uh, today I have a very special guest, uh, one of my brothers from uh, Wake Up Warrior, uh, Travis Motley. Travis is an entrepreneur. Uh, he's a, a father and he is a uh, master copywriter and he also owns a business called Motley Marketing. So Travis, I want to thank you for being on today. And thank you for having me. I'm, uh, I've am i been looking forward to this. This should be fun. Yeah. So uh, just to give you guys a little kind of preface is, uh, you know, Travis uh, and I met each other uh, about three and a half years ago, three, four years ago. Uh, inside of a program called Wake Up Warrior, and uh, I was one of his coaches. Uh, and just throughout the years, we've uh, we've really connected and got to know each other. But um, with you know the current situation that's been happening, uh, you know, I commented on a post of Travis's, and we kind of went back and forth. And and I got to a place where I was like, "Hey, man, like this is a this is a big topic. Like we need to talk about this." And and really, it kind of came down to. Uh, you know, racism, you know, politics, just some different stuff. And, and I thought, man, instead of arguing on Facebook, you know, and, and just, you know, there's a lot of things that get lost inside of, you know, texts and, and copy and stuff like that. And I'm like, hey, I'm going to bring Travis on the podcast and let's just have an open conversation because, you know, I don't know about you, man, but this seems to be something that no one ever talks about, no one ever resolves, and it always ends up kind of in a bad way. Uh, and I really just wanted to bring you on today to have, you know, a deep dive conversation about this. So I want to thank you for being here. I mean, absolutely. And, and I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, we, we just don't talk about these things. And like you said, I think, I think at the end of the day, we don't talk about them because well, there's lots of reasons that we're probably going to be discussing a few of them, but primarily it's like people just have a hard time being uncomfortable and all these conversations bring bring a situation out where uh, it forces people to be in these uncomfortable environments. Sure. And so we avoid them. And then all of a sudden things pop off, you know, on the media or, you know, they get a certain amount of coverage and then we're expected to know how to, you know, communicate with each other, even though we've been taught, trained to just never bring it up. Right. You're not allowed to talk about it. So. Yeah, so so let's kind of start, man, with you and, and your upbringing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where did you grow up? You know, what was, you know, dude, what was life like for you, you know, growing up? Uh, I'm not sure if you, you know, grew up in Seattle or that area or not, mm -hmm. but, you know, what was what was life like for you? Yeah, so, um, so like, uh, my dad's black, my mom, mom's white. Uh, I grew up in a, a suburb right outside of um, of Seattle, um, middle to like lower class uh, family as far as like the socioeconomics goes, but you know, lots of siblings, um, uh, lots of uh, lots of history in my house. Like I, I grew up where you know my dad. All we did was talk about um, history, but specifically like family history you know, like where we came from, who our granddad was, who our great granddad was. And we would, you know, it was, it was, um, a narrative that was so, so prevalent in our house, um, growing up. So a lot of these opinions and a lot of these experiences have that kind of in the background, right? My, so when you say, well, like when you say that, you know, what, what was the narrative, you know, for you growing up, because, you know, I'm going to share my narrative, which is going to be probably complete opposite end of the spectrum, but, I think it's important that we understand that. 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think as far as narratives go, I guess it kind of depends on the situation. Like in my house, the way that, that we grew up, as it relates to this issue of, of, of race and politics, um, you know, we were taught to like always be aware, um, you know, we couldn't go to certain parties or do certain things without having a conversation about, well, who's going to be there. You have to understand, like, if something goes down, you're going to be looked at or treated differently. So we were always taught to, you know, think, think a little bit further down the line, always be on guard just a little bit, not from a place of hate or, you know, like we're victims or anything, but just from a place of awareness and trying to, you know, create as much power as we, as we possibly can. Um, and these, in these tight situations. So, so there's that part of it. And then there's also just like the, there's also the aspect of um, like talking about things. So in my house, we, we spoke about what's going on. We weren't afraid to come to my dad or my mom and say, Hey, this person just said this to me, or this person did that to me, or the cops did this or, you know, whatever. And then we'd always have these, you know, we'd always kind of like break it down and, you know, go into like, okay, so like, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. So let me ask you, man, like, uh, I want to like, so when you say like, is there specific things that happened to you growing up that, that kind of went towards, you know, almost like profiling, you know, in a sense? Sure. Or- oh yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, like I've got plenty of stories. I mean, the first one that jumps off the top of my head is, you know, I was, uh, in, uh, in high school, me and, me and my best friend who's now actually a cop in Texas, he was, um, He's black. I'm mixed. We were with like uh, six other uh, friends of ours. Um, those those six guys were all white. They all went off and they actually did like a beer run, right? Oh, so they okay. went, robbed a store. Classic high school bullshit, right? Sure. Me and my buddy, we stayed back at the apartment, and you know the. the our crew comes back with that alcohol. We're like, okay, cool, whatever. And then all of a sudden the cops roll in. Cops roll in like four deep. And in the very last cop car, there's, uh, they actually brought the, they brought the clerk from the store. And the only two people who he picked out were me and my friend, who were the only two people who weren't there. We were arrested. And then finally our, our other friends were like, hold on, this is wrong. Like we were the ones that did it. They cleared everything up. They didn't arrest them. They unarrested us and then just made us pour it out. And at the time we all laughed about it. No big deal, whatever, you know, but I mean, to think like where that could have gone. Right. If like that, that type of stuff happens all the time. And there's people that are in jail to this day because there wasn't a friend to say, hold on a second. That that was wrong. Sure. You know, that's just like, and those things happen quite often. Um, and, you know, I mean, like even, I dated my, my current wife. I, I dated her um, in high school and I wasn't allowed at her family cabin. Okay. You know, we're talking like in Seattle, <laughs> like 2008, 2009, 2010, right. not being allowed to go to this cabin. Okay. Because her parents or just because her grandparents. Okay. And yeah. so, so like, dude, you're growing up, You know, I mean, I'm guessing even you for maybe a traditional guy who has, you know, two black parents, even you is like, hey, now I got a white parent and a black parent. So, you know, I'm guessing, dude, back then, like there wasn't a whole lot of that, you know, like there is today. So back then there was even kind of more of, hey, what side am I on? Am I on, you know, this side or I'm on this side? Um, And I can't imagine what kids, you know, would say back then to you. Um, yeah. cause it's kind of like, well, where do I fit in? So uh, what was that like, man? Oh yeah. I mean, all the different names and the, the Oreos and whatever, you know, the white chocolates and just the little names. but you know, at the end of the day that, that stuff was prevalent, but it, it never like interrupted or got in the way of anything for sure. me. Like I didn't feel like, Oh, my, like I can't go and produce because somebody just called me an Oreo. Right. You know what I mean? So I, I think I think with the topic of race, I think the hard part is when when we go down like the example routes, um, it's tough because that's like the overt stuff. And sometimes actually the overt stuff 
is it are the things that are easier to to navigate through right right versus the stuff that's like sneaky and in the background and you can't really see it yeah give me an example of, sudden, of that of like being sneaky yeah just like what you like kind of what you're describing because like i'll be honest man some of the stuff i don't see uh yeah. you know the same way you do because like i have a yeah. different experience yeah yeah, so like a perfect example of, of of like sneaky stuff from personal experience, and even now to this day, I I, I see it when I coach high school kids because uh, I coach high school football. But um, you know, I've I've seen so many situations where you know uh, two white kids, you know, they they either skip school, they break the rules in some way. And it's assumed that, oh, well, they're just being, you know, like knuckleheads. You know, I skip school one time and it's detention. My locker's getting searched. It's like they took the opportunity just to go all in to see, like, what what else do I have? Right. And, like, there's a lot of these stats, too. Like, there's a whole bunch of stats that that back a lot of my experience up in terms of just the punishments always being just a little bit extra. And the, and the assumption being that I'm wrong versus that there might be a, a misunderstanding. Right. And a lot of those things, it's, it's, it's like constant, like um, on the football team that I coached, the reason why I actually walked away from my coaching position is because me and the head coach got into it a few times about this issue where we would have, you know, um, one of our black kids would maybe, you know, they got a personal foul, right? They got, you know, and they get a flag th- thrown on them and the comments are stop being so ghetto or this isn't Rainier Beach, which is, you know, an inner city sure. school here. Um, same exact type of behavior, same exact uh, outcome. And it's like, hey, buddy, calm down, calm down, calm down. And the coaches are like trying to protect the player like they should, like, you know, remove him and try to get him calmed down. But it's not this assumption that he is ghetto or a gangster or any of the other language that starts flowing out. And it's it's those little like micro comments that will affect the, that that coach will start saying, well, this guy's just undisciplined, which can lead to he can't play on this team or he can't have have that position. He can't be a starter. Where's, where's the disciplined guy? And I'm sitting there like, there's, he's just as disciplined. You're just reading into the situation with a bias for some reason, probably, you know, a lot yeah, of, we all, I think we all have that, man. I mean, to Absolutely. some extent, like I, and I think, you know, in some ways it kind of goes both ways of, um, mm-hmm. you know, I'll give you a little history of like, dude, how I grow up. My dad's like total redneck. I grew up in Spokane, Washington. I mean, there was no black kids at our school until, I think maybe I was like 16, 17. It was only, you know, maybe Asian. Um, And so I never even really, you know, got to even know black guys until, you know, I I started boxing and we would meet them on boxing trips. But until I got to college and played football and I'm like, oh my gosh, like my whole team's like, you know, black guys. And all of a sudden, you know, but I think in sports, you know, kind of my mindset was always like, hey, if this dude's on my team, like we're a team, man. And I don't see the color. And 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 I'll be honest with you, like going into that, I'm like, holy cow. But I got kind of freaked out because I'm like, I don't even know how to like talk, how to like do these things. Cause I've never really been around these guys and then I'm around them. They're on my team. And I'm like, dude, they're just like anybody else. Yeah. And, but that was, you know, I think a lot of times what we do is we take a snapshot of something that happens in life a current situation. And then we put it into our movie of our own life experience. Mm -hmm. Um, And then that is what we project onto the world. Mm -hmm. You know, and and I would say for me up until, you know, 18 years old, I mean, I just never even really knew any black kids because they didn't, they weren't in my school, they weren't in my sports. But as I've, you know, kind of went through, um, you know, and then I moved to, you know, Tacoma, I think at like 22, 23 years old, and then it was like, you know, obviously that's, you know, it has a, a larger African-American population. And so I got to kind of know them a lot more. But yep. uh, I think the big thing is, is, you know, like 
as I got to know people, I think, you know, as growing up, there's, you know, it's like, even at my house is like, we didn't really talk about, you know, black versus white or, or issues like that. Cause Mm -hmm. you know, for me, I didn't see that, but I'll be honest with you growing up in a community like that, you know, I got pulled over, I got in trouble at parties. I got kind of like, you still got kind of picked on because, Hey, I was an athlete. I was bigger. I was more muscular. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll be honest with you. Like I I got my ass kicked quite a few times by cops. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of the things that I see people write about, well, Hey, you don't know about this because it's never happened to you. But it's like, I see guys writing stuff down. I'm like, dude, all that shit's happened to me. Yep. Um, and sometimes I think, you know, guys that are, that are African American, they don't see or hear about what happens in, in these communities. And mm-hmm. so they automatically assume, well, Hey, you've never had that happen to you. And it's like, dude, I've had a lot of shit happen to me now a lot of it i'll be honest and say yeah i did deserve it some of it i didn't and it just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time but you know i I want people to know that hey like just because you know it happens in certain communities it also happens in our communities to where i see dudes get their ass kicked for for a reason sometimes and then i see dudes get their ass kicked for no reason other times um, and so I kind of have seen both sides of that. And obviously, you know, I've done mm-hmm. a lot of the same stuff as you as beer runs in high school. Luckily, yep. <laughs> I never got caught for that, but I got caught for some other stuff. Right. So, but yeah. yeah. And I mean, I think I think like with this racial narrative, it's it's very complex and complicated. And and part of it is you're right. Like not every single uh, time um, a black person, um, you know, gets in gets into it with the cop or a cop you know beats their ass or even a cop kills him not every single time is is like a racist thing um and there's a reason why you know like in our community like we don't we don't uh protest or we don't bring to light when you know there's the black guy who rushed the cop with the gun and he gets his head blown off no he that that guy deserved to die he's, right. he's an idiot what were you doing like we don't talk about that person because we understand that's that's not an example of the type of racism that we're trying to bring to light we sure. the things that come to light are when the 12 year old gets killed at the you know at the park like there's not a, like there's not a lot of white 12 year old boys who are assumed that they're guilty to the point where they get killed by the cops at a park if that stuff just doesn't happen in in that community so it's like we look at the examples where you have to ask yourself, like, it w- would this same outcome, would the same situation happen and happen so prevalently to people who who look different, you know? And and here's the thing, like, I'm I'm mixed, you know, and I'm very light for being mixed as well. So like, I even inside of my experiences, I have a lot of privilege inside of it because even I don't get profile the same way that my older brother does right so th- th- there's even different experiences with the types of you know skin tone sure it, but i, I but i also think part of that is you know for me you know i have some friends that are cops is i mm-hmm. think i think we're taught to profile people like mm-hmm. i think we're taught systematically to profile people and put them into categories. Like I even mm-hmm. think about, Hey, what about nine 11? What were we taught to profile? Now we're taught to profile. Anybody from the middle East could be a potential right. threat. I'm sure back, you know, when there was Vietnam war going on, anybody who was Asian, they were taught to say, Hey, this person might be a threat. <laughs> and I think the media does a really good job of presenting that of, Hey man, if you wear, you know, pants that hang down, you got to be a thug. Or if you listen to rap music, you got to be a thug or, or something. I think the media plays into that and kind of programs that into us a little bit. Um, and so to me, like cops do a very similar thing as they start profiling people based on how they look, how they dress, what color they are, what color they're not. Uh, Because I think, you know, at the end of the day, if if you had a group of white guys that were like big and buff and some skinny cop, I mean, he's probably going to profile them the same way as, 
you know, a group of, of guys that are like standing on the corner with their, you know, pants down and, and wearing different colors. I think he's going to mm-hmm. profile them in a similar way. I agree, man. Like, I think there is an issue with racism. Um, but I think what's, you know, sometimes what happens is, is, uh, you know, the, the issue is, is like we're profiling people because that's what society tells us or that's what, you know, a cop's job is to kind of profile people and say, hey, if they look this way, this must mean this thing. It's not right or wrong, but it's just the way that I think the job is is being taught. That gets passed us through the media. Um, and then we come into this and things get really cloudy and confusing because it's like, well, now the white cop killed the black you know, the black guy. And so it's got to be racism. Uh, And I really start looking at it as like, man, this is like a deeper issue. This is like a man issue of what the, what's going on with the man, you know? And if we use the same, you know, what's happened now with this George Floyd guy, it's like, okay, this cop, dude, he's got a history of being angry and like, you know, excessive force shooting people. Like why the hell was this guy even on in the streets? Right. You know, and, and so like, can you touch on that a little bit? Like, yeah, I mean, I think what you're saying, like, I agree with, uh, almost a hundred percent. I think that there's, that there is a, uh, a conditioning that happens when you grow up in this country that's unique to this country. It's, yeah. it's unique to our media. Um, and it's, it's interesting because as you know, it's a frustrating narrative for me as well, because again, like in my house, going back to as far as I can remember, we and, and you know, my community, all we would do, not all we would do, but 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 we would complain about the media all the time, constantly. Right. Right. Like, how, why is it that it's only these images that get shown? Why is it that every time that we're cast in a movie, we only have these parts? Why is it, you know, I mean, they're just you go on and on like the the stories they choose to cover versus the, uh, the ones that they don't. Uh, and we would always say like, man, this is perpetuating. This is, this is training people to see us in this light. And then you wonder why the cop is afraid because he sees somebody who looks like all the people he was programmed to fear. And because that, that cop in that moment hit in a lot of these situations, they didn't grow up around other black people. So they have nothing else to test their, their assumption against it's, right. they've yeah, only it's been the in movie. environments where, yeah. It's the and movie. so there's these reels playing in everybody's head, you know, about who, who people are right. and what, and, and so, yeah. So, so, so people carry that with them and that's a problem. Right. For and sure. I think when you talk about um, racism, it's, it's impossible to get away, especially nowadays, it's really impossible to get away from the systems that create that racism and the media is is one of those systems yeah well dude it's the worst system right it's 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 definitely one of the worst i think though that the conversation of the media is interesting because now it's become real prevalent but and even though i don't disagree with a lot of the critique and the criticism that the media is getting i just think that the angle at which or the timing seems a little bit convenient or interesting. Well, you know, I I looked at, I look at a statistic and it was, Mm -hmm. uh, it was like the black lives matter movement Uh uh, from there's been nothing that's really came up on it since 2016. And then they show this huge, there was like a little spike in 2018 Um, and then it shows, I mean, obviously right now it's like off the chart. Right. Um, and and so, you know, yeah, there's, you know, obviously the election year, but like, dude, I look at like, okay, the same media that's lying to us about COVID-19, they're all of a sudden going to tell the truth about Mm -hmm. what's happening right now. Um, to me, the media just pours gasoline on whatever fire is burning. Right. You know, and, and it sucks because it, it pulls people away. I think at the end of the day, if we, if we watched what's happened in the last 10 days is you've watched everything kind of like burn 
And then all of a sudden it's like people get the hate out, get the anger out, get the rage out, and then they want to come back together. But what happens is, is we just move on. We don't actually work through the problem after, you know, after, Hey, I, you know, after this happens, it's like, okay, well, what are we going to do to move forward? And I think people just leave it where it is and then they jump and then, they, and then it's like the next time everybody kind of forgets about it mm -hmm. then it comes up again and it's been this way, you know, dude, how long has it been this way? Like year, like you go back to Rodney King, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, and it's like, it just continues to happen because it's a cycle and we don't ever work through the cycle. It just keeps happening. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, no, I mean, I made a comment to you about, um, what was it? I think it was called, uh, manufactured racism, right? Yes. So to me, manufactured racism is, is not disrespecting the real racism that's happening. It's disrespecting, magnifying that, you know, that the media is portraying this as, as something, you know, bigger. It's portraying that like everybody's kind of going after it now because all of a sudden mm -hmm. it's an election year, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's like, we're going to just put each other against, we're going to put whites against blacks. And mm -hmm. to me, like that's manufactured racism and it's, it's covering up, you know, a deeper issue inside of society where it's like, you're talking about the little things that are happening in schools or the little things that no one's talking about are happening. It's covering up that stuff. That's where I get like frustrated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think so. I think that there's a difference between, I guess, the two beefs in the media that we have. Like my beef with the media is more so of the conditioning side of things to, to basically feed this narrative or feed this, this infection of, uh, of not understanding black culture or the black community or seeing right. them in a very dangerous light, right? So that's like on one side of the spectrum. Right. And I think, that's still a thing, right? Like it's still a problem. Now sure. on the other side, you have, I think like what you said, I feel like it's media being media. It's just whatever they can do to get clicks, you know, whatever they can do to just to, just to feed off of the energy of, of the moment. And that could be racial. It could be, you know, around any, pretty much any social issue, right? Um, and they're going to get behind and they're going to pour gasoline on it. Right. Um, I think that it's different though, in the sense they're them pouring gasoline on the fire doesn't take away from the fact that there's a fire. Right. Like if they point out a racist incident, it doesn't make the incident less racist. Sure. But to me, it might, it, yeah. It, is 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 the George Floyd thing a racist issue? There's one, mm -hmm. uh, or a man issue? Because I, I want you to I want you to consider that you know this man, this cop, has a long history mm -hmm. of issues, um, and and yes, George Floyd is black. You know he didn't deserve to die. Like I I, I think I hope you you know know that I agree with that. But mm -hmm. the way that it happened. Like, you know, people say, oh, okay, this guy's like a five-time felon. Okay, cool. He's passing a, a fake $20 bill. But yeah, at the end of the day, he doesn't, no one deserves to die for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so yes, justice is a huge thing. But to me, is that a man is issue or is that a race issue um, when you step into that conversation? Well, I mean, I mean, to me, it's, it's 100% a race issue. And I see it as that because at the time that cop has no idea that he has five felonies. So his, his record has nothing to do with the situation. It, it had no effect on the way that he was handled or the reason why he died. Sure. But, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, have you watched, have you watched the video on any of the stuff with him? Like when he gets arrested? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, he falls down, you know, they get yep. him back up, uh, you know, and then you got, you know, the Asian cop there, um, mm -hmm. you kind of have a lot going on. And then also these guys supposedly work together for mm -hmm. 17 years at a, a, a club or some mm -hmm. bar 
One's outside, yep. one's inside. You know, they had to at some point know each other. Mm-hmm. Um, so do you, you know what? I guess what I'm saying is, is like, one, do we know all the facts? Mm-hmm. Okay. We know some, right? Mm-hmm. We know, mm-hmm. you know, what the media said. Mm-hmm. Do these guys have a history? Mm-hmm. You know, and what is the history? Or, and, and so to me, it's like, I don't know, man. It's just kind of like a, it almost seems like a setup um, to me in a sense mm-hmm. of, you know, yes, did he die? You know, well, I, I hope he did because I hope the media is not that sick to like do some shit like that. Yeah. But yeah. It, wouldn't, it wouldn't put it past me based on some other events. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, to me, like you see that because of your life experience. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, you know, I've coached like thousands of guys inside of wake up warrior. And so I look, I step back and say, okay, well, listen, what's the real, like this dude, this dude has a history of hate. This dude has a history of, you know, issues. Like he may have actual mental issues. Like this is a a issue with a man who has, you know, who has thrown force and and rage into his job. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so I really see it as a man issue and that's where mm-hmm. I kind of, I guess that's where it kind of gets frustrating for me is, mm-hmm. you know, is this a, a race thing or is this like a man thing? Like at the end of the day, I think we have an issue in society of men, um, that aren't stepping up as leaders that aren't stepping up as fathers. And you could even go to the African American communities and see mm-hmm. that many of these kids don't have fathers, mm-hmm. um, you know, and stuff like that. And I really see a huge issue with this. Um, But I also don't want to not shine the light on that racism is not real. Right. So, I mean, so there's a lot there, I guess, that I'd have to say about. So first, first, um, so when it comes to the George Floyd, like that specific situation, when it comes to that, that one, um, like any any uh, incident taken in isolation, it's easy to say, well, we don't know all the facts. It's easy to, I can, we can always find a way to sure. yeah. throw enough questions on it to make sure that there isn't a, um, a like, like a specific um, outcome that we agree on. Sure. Because it's because, because we can just ask, you know, enough questions around it. But I, but, but I think, I think the problem though is, or what could be the problem here is, Whenever it's um, cops um, or or almost any other race of people, they, for the most part, we try and look at it like a man issue. We try to look at it like a an individual, not necessarily part of a bigger thing, right? But when we see a black kid or anything happen in the black community, it's almost like, well, that's a problem of the community. Like, like you brought up the dad issue, like every single dad issue is an isolated issue. So is it, if, if we're going to isolate this cop with George Floyd, should we not also isolate every single, every single example of things happening in the black culture that, that gets swept as a black problem? You know, and and to me, that is almost that is that is an example of part of the um, with racism in the backdrop. That's that's like when when a black person does something, it's seen as as part of the community. Like, oh, that's what they do. That's the dangerous part about this area. Right. Nobody isolates their situations. But we isolate the cop situation. It's, it's much easier for us to do that because, and I think, and I think Jesse, what happens a lot of times, and I mean, I could be wrong about this, but I think when you, when you break it down to the person, it's easy, especially for someone like you, who you coach thousands of men, right? If you make it about him, you are more comfortable finding an answer for that problem because you know how to do it. If it's about race, it's very uncomfortable because we don't we don't have a solution. Right. So we don't want to go towards the area of the conversation or we don't want to 
I mean, and we all do this in different areas of our life and in different types of scenarios. But I think with race, I think part of the reason why people don't, or they, there's resistance or the, and there's tension mm -hmm. to see it as a racist issue or see it as a big, more of a, more of a systemic problem is because it's much harder to solve. There is no answer. Yeah. I mean, I don't think that, well, if there was an answer, I don't think anybody, I don't think what people happened. want, want to solve it is what yes. I'm really saying. And I think politics play into that is, you know, they don't want to solve the issue because then we get along and then there is no issue. So what do they get to play on then? Yeah. And that's, and that's something like not to gloss over what we're talking about or, or, or skip ahead, but that's something where I think that we can both agree on, but to really hit home on, mm -hmm. on, on what you were just saying. Um, it, I think it's important that we, that we consider the, the fact that if we're not going to, if, if we're not going to give black people the same benefit of the doubt, and give them give give each individual that commits certain um, actions or negative actions, and say, well, that's that one dad who did that, right? We don't know that one dad situation, or we don't know that one mom situation. So it's unfair for us just to lump lump it all as if that that's a black problem, right? Yeah, but what right. I'm saying is 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 the man himself has an issue. I don't know if it's from his dad. I don't know if it's from any of those things. But like, if we look at both of these guys, they're both men. They both have a history. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, let's be honest. Like, you know, one guy's he uh, he robbed a house with five other guys. He went to prison mm -hmm. for it, right? Mm -hmm. There was also a gang rape involved in that uh, on a woman, and mm -hmm. they can only charge him with one thing, so they charge him with the one thing. Mm -hmm. So. You know, and then he's also committing a crime at the time and place that this happened. Um, so he's, you know, he's went, I think he went, what, 11 years or 10 years without, you know, being in trouble for anything. And then he's passing a, you know, counterfeit money, whatever. That's why the whole thing went down. But uh, I'm not taking away from what happened to him is his death. But what I'm saying is, is, you know, he obviously has a history just like the cop has a history. Uh, so looking at it as, yeah, no one's going to solve the man problem. Okay. Like, let's just be honest, unless you're going to go through some training and be like, but what I'm saying is, is, is that, is that a man problem of men, you know, you know, say there's one guy's like a cop. He wants to overpower everybody. He obviously has a fucking history of it, right? Mm -hmm. Why is this guy still a cop? Mm -hmm. You know, and and he has a long hit standing history of that, and he's using that on someone else. Whether it's hate, whether they knew each other, it doesn't matter. The guy died, and you know, there's an issue with that. But yeah. that's where I see as a as a man problem. And, and right. that's my lens. That's my movie that I brought into it. And, and just like you, we have a hundred people based off their life experience, what they've grown up with. That's the movie they see. Right. Yep. Yep. So, so I mean, I think one thing to consider is, and this is, I guess where we might be able to actually um, fuse this movie, right. Create a remix. And that is, so it could be like, we can say, okay, yes, that one individual police officer um, uh, had a racist problem. He like, let's just say, for instance, he was racist, uh, whatever. And that's just that one cop. And now, again, like my best friend is a cop. I have families that are cops. Uh, I played football with three of good friends who are cops all around. Like it's not, to me, it's not necessarily this anti-cop sure. conversation. Um, but I think the, the, the cops are an extension of the system. And so it shows up there a lot more than in other agencies, I guess I should say. But um, to go back, is it possible that he's racist? And like you said, how, how has this guy been allowed to stay on the force with all these other complaints how has he been allowed or well, is it possible that we live in a society now where 
every time race gets brought up, it's like, oh, well, that's just the race card. Nobody believes it. Nobody wants to think that the issue is actually racist, right? It's, it's a constant argument of like, what's racist and what's not. Sure. And so is it possible that the people who are reviewing his complaints see that, oh, it's just another black guy saying that he profiled him. And because the person who's reviewing their record, they also have a clip that's playing that, oh, these guys are just victims. Right. Or they're from they're just, this neighborhood. They're lying or they're just from, you know, yeah, this neighborhood. So they're all lying. So right. they're also in that loop. And so the system, the people who operate the system allowed that cop to somehow be there at that time, which ultimately led to George Floyd's death in the system where we actually, and again, that goes back to the conditioning of the mind, but, and so it, but in a system where we take every complaint seriously or look into them, right. Or, or we believe at least the majority of them, I should say, not every single complaint is going to be valid, but let's just say the majority of them are. He's not on the streets. Sure. He, like, he's not a cop anymore. And so that's the conversation. That's where I think the conversation can go from the man to and blend it into the system that has allowed that man to have his position. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I look at this as, you know, I could see, hey, he's from this neighborhood, so he must be, you know, this, or mm -hmm. these guys are just, you know, punks or whatever. And and that's, you know, I can see that because, you know, that I, I would say like, hey, if you're from a specific neighborhood where you live, like you said, Rainier Beach, what does that automatically say? Well, right. It says you must Island, be, ghetto. Yeah, yeah you must or, be this because uh, you're yeah. from there, you know, yep. or you're from Bellevue, so you must be yep. this. Yep. You know what I mean? So yeah, I get that. Like I, I'm not disagreeing with that at all, man. I think right. uh, based off you know where we're from, it's like it's like somebody being from South Central or Orange County. Like yep. You know right. I, I right. see all that. So and the difference is the difference is the outcome, even though that they might have the same the the dynamic of the psychology in terms of being painted uh based off of where you're from the problem though is that when you're painted you know whoever you are from OC, uh, the oc doesn't get you killed doesn't get you right. put into a you can still go home and eat dinner with your kids right or, right or if you're a kid play and it can just help you like you could get jobs because of it you can get access because of it you can get extra benefits because of it um so, yeah, but I mean, as far as the dynamic or the mechanics of judging people based off of where they're from, yeah, it happens everywhere. Um, and then to, you know, kind of like where you were going with this whole thing was, was um, you know, at the end of the day, are these two groups that we have in power, R's and D's, and the media, whatever role that they play, are, like, is this whole thing just a setup to, to keep people divided? Um. And I, and I think, I think, and I mean, I don't know how deep you want to go down this rabbit hole, but there to me, and I know a lot of people uh, that, that I talk to, um, it's like easy. Like that's the obvious, that's obvious to us. Yeah, I would hope so. Yeah. And, um, but I think, and this is where it becomes difficult. Like this is where I think, I think people need to see the nuance in it is like, we can have a conversation about how corrupt our politicians are. And we can have a conversation about how our politicians want there to be certain things in place in our society. Like a lot of them want racism in place because it helps them get more votes. Some of them want racism in place because it takes votes away from other, like it, or both, it's both sides to want. control something. Yeah. Whether it's the vote, not the vote, or, you know, keep people, you know, where they're at. So they, they don't. Threaten. Yes. And, but I think there's a small little like twist in the narrative though, where it splits. And so we can, me and you can agree on that part. Like, yeah, there's these people in charge who don't really want our best interest. But what is it fixing? Cause I, I honestly don't think they want what's in our best interest either, whether you're on any side. I think oh, no, both sides. I'm, saying, best I'm saying like as Americans, they our politicians don't want what's best for us. Yeah, they want and what's best for them. They want what's best for them, right. So for that, is, that is a real 
narrative that like everybody can everybody can get behind that sure right it's an easy one to understand there's all the evidence and proof in the world right but where it splits though like where where that narrative splits is if just because that's true it doesn't it doesn't mean it doesn't uh mean that it's fake at the same time like what what's happening even though that these people might want it to happen doesn't mean that because it happens it's fake and i see a lot of people i don't know if this you know if if you're in this category or not but i see a lot of people they come away with the they come away saying well because this group really really wants racism to exist and they and they love to exploit racism right then when people cry racism it's well it's only because like you you think that because they want you to think that right i guess yeah. uh you know where i'm at with that is you know yes it, it makes you think well okay well i'm not going to pay attention to this or feed into it because it's it's the the left or the right feeding into that so i'm just not going to pay attention to it at all right uh, because it's fake and it, you know, if that's what you're kind of saying, then, you know, I guess I don't, I don't look at it that way. I look at it as like, let's not take the bait and let's like come together and work together on, you know, cause for me, it's like, Hey, I'm, I'm worshiping, worshiping a false idol by getting upset mm-hmm. at you for posting what you post. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I'm yeah. worship what's my false idol is what I actually think I believe mm-hmm. in me being mm-hmm. right. Uh, and so really, you know, for me to come on this call is like, Hey, I want to challenge what I've been taught to believe in the narrative that I've been taught to believe, because I don't think I know everything. I guess where I land on that is, is I don't want to buy into all of that. Um, and that doesn't fix racism. That doesn't fix what's really going on. Uh, but I want to lean into, you know, to this and and work together with people to where it's like, Hey man, let's come together and like, let's work on the real problem and and move forward versus, you know, kind of buying into the hype of, of what the media is doing, even though, yes, you know, part of it's, you know, true is what's happening, but I, I really like think of it in a different way. Yeah. So, yeah. And I mean, I think, I think like just you having this call with me, you know, says a lot like it doesn't surprise me obviously just because of the programs that we've been in um that you're willing to get uncomfortable and challenge and test things right so um and that's a great you know example for other people to do as well i I think i think black people feel like when we hear come together a lot of times we hear that as like we need to come closer to your side in yeah. terms of in terms of the narrative, not like a side, right? But in terms of the, the narrative, like walk, walk yeah, like line. come to my neighborhood and let's talk or whatever. right, yeah, right. Versus, I don't, like, I don't know if it, that's yeah. To me, I don't know if that's if that was if that's what fixes it. Is me, you know, does me going to uh, African American neighborhood fix it, or does us meeting somewhere in the middle? No, uh, I think I think I think in terms of in terms of the narrative, in terms of saying, okay, let's all come together. But to us, it's like, if you, if you say, let's all come together, part of coming together means believe what we're saying. Sure. It or, doesn't mean, I mean, to me, it means, yeah, it doesn't mean believe it. It means hear it because there right. may be some shit you may not believe with me. That's true. But like, you'll hear it and you're yep. like, Hey, yeah, now I can kind of see, man. Like it's true. Yeah. Um, yeah. so, so I think on, on both sides, it's kind of like, okay, well, we don't have to believe each other, but we can hear each other and yep. in hearing each other, we feel each other. And I think that's where we're missing is, is we're not feeling each other. We're like mm-hmm. yelling at each other in a right. sense, you know, but one of the things I hate seeing is I hate seeing, you know, white kids in black neighborhoods fucking destroying. Yep you know, neighborhoods and shit like that. And, and dude, that to me is like, Hey, call me and let me come to your neighborhood and get these punks out of there. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because that, that stuff is what like drives me crazy, you know, watching Mm -hmm. that. And it's hard to watch that, you know, Mm -hmm. especially knowing that, Hey, this is, 
you know, this is, uh, this is kind of what our society's turned into. And it, it's, it's hard mm-hmm. to watch that, man. Right. Right. And I mean, to that point, to that point, I think, I think that the fact that so many people feel outraged by what's going on right now, like there's, it, it, it's an interesting thing right now where I think I see George Floyd and I see what happened and I see, you know, to me, on, on, on one side, I'm like not surprised. On one side, I'm like, I don't know what the difference is between this and everything else. Why are people getting so freaked out? We've like, I don't have to see that video to know what's going on. I don't have to see that video to know the problems that we have in this country. Um, because again, like, you know, uh, like we don't, like we don't experience racism through the media. You know, we experience it in real life. And right. even when it's not our direct, like, hey, this happened to me, it's like, well, that happened to my brother, or that happened to my friend, or that happened to my dad, or that happened, you know, like, it's, it's, it's like all around us. And then, you know, we carry it, and then there's no outlet for expression for it. Like, that's why music is so big, and hip hop really became big, because that was like an outlet, right? It's an outlet to express that. Because the movies and the, and the media wasn't really doing that. Like, it wasn't that place, and then there was really no platform where still to this day it's hard hard to have a conversation because it's just like well that's just the race card that's just the race card we like it there is there's a lack of like you said there's a lack of people being willing to hear what people are trying to say so on one hand it's like the the fact that we're having this conversation says a lot because there was how many opportunities before this happened like how is this any different than eric gardner who got choked out also same exact thing like it's no different Right. It's just that there was no coronavirus back then. And so people had sports and work and shit to be able to, you know, turn the channel. Right. This is the one thing that forced us to really like sit there and think. So a lot of people in my community, like we 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 love these conversations, appreciate these conversations and these types of conversations. And but it's almost like the the, the mere fact that we're having it right now is proof of what has been happening for so long in terms of there hasn't been this belief. Sure. There hasn't like, why? Well, I why mean, let's, let's be honest. If people aren't going to work, if they're not operating in everyday life, then mm-hmm. they can just go back to what they were doing. What they were they doing. They yeah. Can't. Yep. And so, you know, it's, it's, there's a, there's a bigger light being shined down on it probably right. more than ever before. Right. Um, you know, and, and so, yeah. And, and so to my point is, I think it might feel to you and a lot of other people, like sometimes I, it could feel like hype or it can feel like, um, this is coming out of nowhere no, and because it's coming out of nowhere, but right, right, right. So maybe not you, but like, I think that's, a that's in the background of a lot of people. Like that's a lot of the narratives that I'm seeing. Dude, let's just be honest, just be honest, man. Like if you're a Trump supporter, you're probably going to be pitching that. I mean, a lot of them are Yeah. like, Hey, this is just, you know, the left and it's the media. They do this every time, you know? So like, I want, I want to call it like, Hey, let's just call it what it is, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, so, so like, dude, a couple of things, like one, you know, obviously you're not a fan of Trump. Right. Um, you know, what is, what is your take on him? Like, uh, um, what do you like? What do you like? Strip away like the hate strip away. Everything. Yeah. Like, why don't you like him? Well, I, I mean, I guess there's a lot of angles I could c- come at on this one, but I think ultimately, um, ultimately I like it's, it's the leadership or the lack of leadership. And what, give me an example of like, you know, what you mean by lack. So like I'm a marketer, right? So so I'm a marketer and I write for a living. I, like all I do. So for, for a living is I get people to believe things to want to buy them. Right. And Trump is a marketer, hundred percent. And when I hear him talk, if you, again, if I, if I strip away everything and we're just, when I hear him talk, he speaks like a, like he speaks like everything is you know he's not saying this but he's not saying that and he's giving you this feeling 
that he's strong because, hey, if I'm strong, then I can do that. It's just like this big marketing game, right? Sure. So, and so he'll say stuff like, well, you know, a lot of people are saying it or, you know, I've got the biggest crowds. I've got the big, you know, it's just like what it's just hypey, hyperbole. And he's, he's, he's relying on that to get people to follow him. Okay. But like, I guess what I'm saying is like, what has he not done? What has he done or not done that you, you know, like, I mean, I get it. Dude. Some of the shit he says is like, well, dude, what the fuck are you talking about? Okay. But like, what's, you give me one example of like something specific you don't like. Cause you know, there was uh Some- yeah, I mean, there was a lot of, like, I'll be honest, I watched the show. Dude, there's 26 errors and in inaccuracies in that Friday or the 13th documentary uh-huh. um, that, like, are, you know, they're either, you know, over-exaggerated misstatements. There's a, there's a lot of things that debunk all of it. I'll be honest with you, like, you know, just watching what was the Game Changers um, mm-hmm. the movie is like everybody wanted to turn vegan after they watched it, which was exactly what they wanted you to do. Um, I have a hard time believing everything I see on a, you know, Netflix documentary. I mean, we obviously had the tiger King. Yes. <laughs> there's some stuff that's true on that, mm-hmm. but dude, I got a thing that's got 26 things that debunk a lot of what it says, uh, especially statistics. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's hard for me to have a conversation about something that it's like I, the, a lot of this stuff isn't, isn't factual. Some of it is I'll agree with. Um, but you know, I, I guess, uh, what's hard for me is like, you know, I see a guy like Obama, like in your community and you guys like, you know, pump him up, but yet here he is, you know, being indicted by the FBI because, you know, he knowingly, uh, knew there was shit going on. He came into presidency. The guy's worth like four or five million dollars. He leaves, and all of a sudden, now he's worth 140 million mm-hmm. in eight years, over a 400 thousand dollar, you know, thing. And then you have Hillary Clinton, who is his right hand person. And dude, she's the most corrupt person like ever. Uh, and so, like, I guess my question is, is like. I have a hard time understanding how Obama is, you know, is held up on this pedestal, but you know, Trump is, you know, he changed the economy up until what 90 or 120 days ago or beginning of the year. Uh, He changed a lot of stuff in our communities, even in, you know, African American communities, like the job rate was higher than it ever been. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I know that's not the only thing, um, but like, that's where I have a hard time. You know, it's like, hey, it doesn't matter what this guy did. You know, it's like there was Ferguson. There was all these other things that happened when Obama was president, but it wasn't like it is now for when Trump's there. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a whole lot. So I guess so. So to go back, though. So let's start back to the the first question of this is and, and this was. So what is it that Trump does like specifically does? Is that what you're saying? So like, yeah. what is it that he's, he's done and, and not including the stuff that he has said or like his past or. Sure. Yeah. Like, dude, I mean, I, I believe we all have a past. Like, I mean, right, right, right. I could, I could dig up, uh, I could dig up a whole lot of shit on anybody if they're in politics from the past mm-hmm. and it ain't going to look good. You know, right. and I think we could probably see any politician like and I'm not just going to tell you Obama. I mean, I go back to Bush and say I don't like him at all. Right. Um, you know, so, yeah, I'm not I'm not going to be stupid and say, well, listen, if you're on the right, then obviously I held you up on a pedestal. If you're on the left, I hate your guts. Right. But, right, right. 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 You know, I see the corruption on both sides. Yeah. Well, and like you said, I mean, like you brought up like uh, Obama knowingly. um you know, spying or like all the different like allegations that he has and Hillary as well. And there, there's just as many allegations against Trump with Ukraine and Trump with Russia and Trump with, uh, I mean, Turkey. And I mean, there's, and those have resulted in, you know, like some could argue that's, that's why he's the fucking president right now. 
you know? And so now, so here's the thing though. So it's hard because I think that there's truth inside of, I mean, each one of those scenarios is like a Pandora's box. Sure. And there's truth inside of all of it. Just like the truth inside of all the stuff about Obama and Hillary. And like, don't, I mean, I, I, like I, I'm personally not the biggest Obama fan. I'm, I'm not a big Hillary fan. I personally, like my personal politics are, I don't like the whole establishment, um, Biden, Clinton kind of Democrat is not m- like who I agree with. Like I'm not on their, their team. If there were teams, I'm not on their team. So I don't mind criticizing them or calling out or having discussions about their corruption because it's there for sure. Sure. Um, but a lot of times the, the same level of proof needed to call them corrupt, we have that and more for Trump. I mean, nobody's been convicted of anything on either side. Nobody ever will on either side. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I think that's about to change, man. I think some shits. I think I think if if this wasn't happening right now and all this COVID-19, this, you know, upbringing, there's you know, to me there's a deeper issue under all of it. Um that's about that's get, been getting exposed for the last, you know, 3 years. Mm-hmm. Um do I believe Trump's innocent? Like no. Um not even close, but I think there's a deeper issue uh, with, you know, child sex trafficking, child slavery. Mm-hmm. Like, I think the actual number one currency in the world is, is the blood of kids uh, more so than oil, more so than anything else. And, and that's, I believe that there's a lot of people responsible on both sides at the hands of that. And that's what I think actually runs the world right now Mm -hmm. or has been. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Like um, I know about a lot of that, uh, that, that, that side of the narrative too, you know? So I think part of my problem again, because, because I'm so deep in marketing, like I can see so many things happening that it's like, for instance, I mean, let's talk about like what you just said. So we've got a narrative out there that says, okay, there's these kids that are disappearing, which is true. We have a narrative out there that says like sex trafficking is the number one organized crime in the world right now, which is true. Right. Yeah, you look at MS 13. Yeah. That was, that was their entire thing and yeah. they're no longer here able to operate. It's true. Right. right. So we got these true events happening and then we've got, but then we have a narrative that gets introduced that connects dots. And then inside that connecting the dots leads you to believe something. Right. And it's no coincidence to me that in all these different um, dots, the, the narrative always leads you to, and Trump is trying to save the day or, and Trump is the only one standing in the way of them. Sure. And it's like, well, if I was to write a marketing campaign, that's exactly how I would do it. Cause if I want them to vote for this person, I'm going to tell a narrative that's going to lead them to believe that the only way out is to vote for this guy. But have people not been in trouble or we've gotten yes. for it? We have absolutely. So, so, but the question, so, but the thing about that narrative and all these narratives is if you just remove, like, let's just say all that's true. And let's say every single thing is true about what you're saying. And then let's just say that Trump is also in on it. Let's just say that's one extra fact, just one extra fact that we introduce into the conversation. It changes everything. Yeah, but let's go one step further. Mm-hmm. What if he was on it? Like, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, 30 years ago. I mean, his wife's from where? Yeah. So, so like to me, in in a certain way, I actually believe he was in on some of it or knew of it so much that he actually was like, okay, well, like, like, dude, this is fucked up. Yeah. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. I, I have, I, I've watched enough stuff to where uh, I've seen enough things 
on video to to lean a little bit towards like this is a fucking this is like a rabbit hole that's like no other yeah yeah exactly but i mean i think i think what you're saying is true i think you like if you just introduce one piece of one fact it throws the narrative off in a major major way which which i actually believe a lot of people dude were involved in this on both sides that have come forward that you know that are like hey these people actually ended up turning on other people to expose them Mm -hmm. and a lot of people are going to hate them for it but they're the way that they actually found out Mm -hmm. um you know so so i i do believe and i don't like mistake i think actually trump was around it i think that's why he hated epstein so much Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think he was you know in on something but um together uh because like think about it if i know everything about you you know everything about me and you turn on me what happens right 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 well i, I mean i think again like if you if, if you if you go back to that narrative right like now like the QAnon groups right sure now if there was in terms of like not your personal beliefs because obviously you've expressed that you think that he could have been at one point involved or may still be involved. Like you're, you're open to that possibility. I'm open to questioning everything because right. at this point it's kind of like nobody fuck. I mean, it's like one guy says one thing, the other yep. guy says something else. And it's like, yep. okay, well I'm going to start digging for the truth. Yep. You know? So let's just say this. So like, um, again, like if we go back to, to connecting dots and narratives, well, was, are there not, what, a thousand to fifteen hundred kids that turned up missing at the border at, after the family separations. Be, I mean, I don't, I don't do. There's, they're missing. There's, uh, I know that. I know one thing. There's, uh, I think they said two to three hundred thousand kids that go missing every year or get year, shuttled yeah. across the border. Yep. Yeah. But but so I'm saying though, but if that's so, like if Hillary's the president. And, and her orders lead to that result, 1,500 missing kids, best believe that's going to be a dot people are going to try to connect to sure. proof that she's in on it. But it's not a dot they're willing to connect as proof that Trump is in on it. Yeah. And to me, yeah. That, goes to the, that, that goes to the power of the story. Well, why would you the put power a wall up if that's the – why would you put a wall up if that's – Well, to criminalize it, and the wall's not up, right? So – you so you claim you're going to put the wall up because that's that's your group the uh, your base loves strength and isolation and American success and so a a a wall is a physical every religion is based off of some type of physical uh you know branding the wall is a perfect physical brand and it's not really happening so it's like it was like a marketing ploy to get to get people behind them and then to criminalize the act of it so that you could throw people in jail. And then that, that goes to the documentary of these private prisons. The private prisons have that contract on the border. They get paid per person, per person who they house. Right. You know, and then this, just this nasty cycle of, we don't know if there was, did, did the private prisons who got that contract on the border, did they, donate millions to the trump campaign we don't know and is that the reason why we passed that policy so we can fill up those jails we don't know i don't know right those are dots that people could connect like you know yeah, they're there it, it, but, we're, five hours. but we're not doing it right yeah, because it, it, because the narrative hours. has because the story hasn't been told for us already the QAnon story has been told already and the dots have been connected for the most part already Sure. Like well, I mean, predetermined story, which makes me feel like it's more of a marketing, which makes me feel like it's more of a. And there can be truth inside of it. Yeah, there's, there's other is. story. There's other stories is. too, not just that. Yeah. But yes. There's, yes. Yes. There's other, there's other stories ones. about Kobe Bryant, you know, dying, yep. you know, in a helicopter yep. crash in 2016 in a TV show, a cartoon. Yep. You know, there's there's all kinds of crazy shit. Mm-hmm. Like, I think the bigger thing is, is, you know, we really have to question what we believe and we can't always just believe what we see in front of us. Yep. Um, you know, and I think at the end of the day, having open conversation is is good. man. So, yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, I I completely agree. I, I think that the more that we have these conversations, 
and start testing the stories and, and the storylines um, is, you know, it's crucial. And, you know, personally, again, like as somebody who writes stories for a living, like I see, I see stuff in, in these frames, which is why it's easy for me to say um, Hillary Clinton is absolutely corrupt. I can, it's easy for me to say that. I, can, I mean, I, I can easily say, uh, I, I hate Biden. Yeah. You know, I mean, like it's, I'm not, I'm not really, uh, I just see, I, I just try to see, I guess, um, the truth in which as, as cliche as that sounded, as everybody can make the exact same claim. Um, I have no problem holding anybody's feet to the fire or just, just telling the, the truth as you know. Sure. And I know you're the same way. It's just a matter of getting access to more stories to be able to test against your own. Right. So, well, hey, man, uh, is there anything else you want to you want to cover today? No, man. All that right. was good. We went through the whole gamut right there. So, yeah. Well, I, you know, and at the end, at the same time, like if you guys are listening to this, like uh, if, if you get into a place where you're reacting to what other people are doing, whether it be on Facebook or, or real life, I think the the number one thing you can do is put your guard down and put your feelings aside and, and have an open conversation with anybody and, and just understand where they're coming from. Cause I think at the end of the day, uh, if we can do that, we can grow and we can go in the right direction and it doesn't matter, you know, what's going on in the world. Like we can, we can do that and we can be a better place and we can support each other in whatever we believe and still have a civil conversation about it. So, yeah, man. Well, Hey, I want to thank you for being on here today and uh, dude, I I wish you uh, nothing but the best and, uh, and you and your family. So likewise, man, always good to catch up and we need to have this more often. The purpose of this show show. is to guide you to realign. With habits that get you to live the life life. you've always dreamed of. This this is the Habit Based Lifestyle Podcast with Jesse Hughes.